in the uh, Old Testament. And, uh, uh, and of course, it's easy to find if you have an electronic Bible. Just keep scrolling, scrolling, scrolling to get to that. And by the way, speaking of that, those of you that have been reading the Bible on Facebook Live, thank you for that. Uh, we are, we're, we're going to make it. It's, it's tremendous. We're right on track uh, to read through the entire New Testament in the month of January. That's a pretty exciting thing for the church to do. So let somebody know that they can be a part of that by joining in with them. I'll uh, remind you of a few things that are coming up as a church here uh, at the end uh, of our message. But today, we're going to continue in our Better Than Ever series. And uh, we're going through uh, all of these books of the Bible that, that, are, that are, or after the people of God went back from uh, uh, the, their land of captivity to the land of promise. And uh, that includes several books of the Bible, and uh, Leslie mentioned them in particular. She mentioned the book of Esther earlier on. So we have Ezra, Nehemiah, we have uh, Zechariah, we have Haggai, and these prophets, and and, and, and workers, and Nehemiah was, was just an average person, so to speak, that God put his spirit upon him and had this work, and, and it's very timely that we're in this right now as a church, that, we're, that we are in, and, and, and again, referencing what she said just a moment ago, is that this is the best time of, for us to be alive. You know, sometimes we think about, boy, I wish I lived back in the Bible days, you know, and then you, you miss a lot of stuff. If you're reading about back in the Bible days, you're missing that. You know, you're missing that all your family gets deported to another country. Okay? Do you want to live? Yeah, I want to live back in the Bible days. All your family gets deported to another country. We think, oh, I wish I lived back in the old days, like it used to be in, in America. Yeah, that, oh, everybody made uh, 75 cents an hour, and, and, and no one had air conditioning in their house, and you didn't have a car to get anywhere. I want to go back to the olden days. So, you know, it's all contextual, isn't it, when we think about some other place and some other time. So this is the moment in the slice of history that God has foreordained that you, would, you and I would live in. And when we look at the book of Zechariah in particular, is that it's an apocalyptic uh, story. Everybody say apocalyptic. <laughs> it's one of those tongue twisters, isn't it? An apocalyptic story, <laughs> the literature of the Bible, and, and, and what we find out is like books like Daniel and Zechariah and Revelation, that they have some similarities there. And what, what God does with apocalyptic literature is that he gives us these wonderful pictures for us to get an idea, something that is a, a visual, and that's why we're being very visual, by the way. That's why that all over the sanctuary there's superhero, and that's why that you want to uh, get yourself a picture of the superhero outfit before you leave today, because this is what we want to leave an impression on your mind, a visible picture. That's what apocalyptic literature does for us. And go to the next slide there, uh, Caleb. And one in the visions of Zechariah, there's there's eight of them. There's eight visions from the, from chapter one on, and uh, we have a, a, a man uh, and, a, and horses and a myrtle tree. We have a man with a measuring line, uh, the cleansing of Joshua, the golden lampstand and the olive trees, the flying scroll, the woman in a basket, and four chariots. So let's go to that next slide. If we can, let's rehearse them one more time. Is that we have these eight visions, and we see that God is. In the beginning, from the end of the, of the book, or rather halfway through, <clears throat> judgment and restoration, punishment on the nations, ensuring room for all, cleansing of sin, divine help to finish the building, cursing the ungodly, removing evil from Israel, and announcing the king to the nations. So it's right there in that sandwich in that middle that we're going to talk about ensuring room for all and the cleansing of sin that we talk about today and that we're, that we're empowered with salvation. We talk about these four words that we're going to rehearse throughout the, the year and that is for us to be engaged and empowered and, and encouraged and equipped for us to grab a hold of what the Lord would have to say to us when we talk about something being better than ever, we all have a reference point of, of, of somewhere in this world where, uh, you know, I, I, I envy Caleb. I envy an 85-year-old man saying he's as strong today as he was when he was a young man. I envy that. I'm not even 60 years old, and I don't feel like I'm 25. I feel like I'm 70 some days, you know. And, and so we have a reference point of, of when we were so-called at the top of our game. 
And so what God wants to reveal to us today, that he empowers us, and the greatest thing that God empowers us with is salvation. When we think about salvation, I'm not just talking about this, the, the removal of sin from our soul. However, that is the greatest thing that God will ever do for you, amen? The greatest thing that God's ever done for you and I is to remove our sin. Praise God. The Bible says, Bless is the Lord to whom the Lord has not imputed sin, which means that God made a way through the prophets of the Old Testament for us to understand what it is that, that He does with us in salvation. And one of those promises, one of those promises is that He removes our iniquity. He removes the sin, guilt from us. In Zechariah chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Many nations will join themselves to the Lord on that day and become my people. This is something that the early church missed. It's something that it took over to Acts chapter 10 for them to figure out. Is that God had a plan from the beginning of time that all humanity would come to him. There are people that have theological arguments about who is destined to die in sin and who is destined to live in heaven. And here's the answer to the question is that that's all up to God. God knows everything and you and I know about that much. <laughs> Amen. And, and God had, but if you're hearing the word today, is that you can be a part of this promise. If you and I have become, to, the Bible says in another passage of scripture, to those who have fled to Jesus for a refuge. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord on that day. That day we're going to talk about it here in just a minute. And become my people. This is not the only time in the word where God had made such a promise. Over in Amos, he had prophesied that there was a coming a time that God was going to reach out to the non-Jewish people. We would use the word Gentile, which just simply means non-Jewish. God had said to Amos that was going to happen and over in Acts chapter 15, they stood up that day and they said, wow, this must have been what Amos was talking about when he says, I, after this, I'm going to return and I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I'm going to build it, put it back together and restore it, put that, put that back together. Why? So that all the non-Jewish people can come, all the Gentiles I have called by my name. And then it was Joel who said, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And he was talking about Jewish and non-Jewish people alike. We talk about everyone in humanity. And then it was while and then it, over in Acts chapter 10, while Peter, the Bible says, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon those non-Italians, those non-Jewish men and, uh, that were in that room, and the Holy Spirit poured out, this is the promise that God has given us. That all that, that would call upon his name would be saved. So over in, in, in Zechariah chapter uh, 2, we, we look at uh, what's going on there. And in Zechariah 2, beginning with verse 1, he says, I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. And so I said, where are you going? And he said, to measure Jerusalem, to see what it's width and what it's length. And there was an angel who talked with me going out, and another angel was coming in to meet him, who said to him, run. Speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as a town without walls, because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Praise the Lord. Here's a question, is that when we look at the, the prophetic thing that God was getting ready to do then, and let me just say this about apocalyptic prophecy and prophecy in general is that when God says something, it comes to pass then and yet to come. In other words, in, in, in other words, that there's a, there, there's a, if I can use this, that God gives you prophecy with interest. <laughs> God gives you a prophetic fulfillment with interest. For instance, when Jesus came and stood before the synagogue and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, and all of that scripture from Isaiah chapter 60 is that at that moment, he said, this, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. But how many of you know today that that scripture being fulfilled in their ears that day wasn't the end, it was the beginning. And so the first time that we see a prophetic thing fulfilled either in our eyes or in the past is that that's not the end of it, it's just the beginning. That God is able. Somebody say, God is able. Hallelujah. God is able. This is the, the God that we serve today. The God that we're talking about is the God of the impossible today. 
I want to tell you this morning, very personally speaking, is that I need God to build a fire all, all around me. I need the Holy Spirit's fire fresh in my soul. I need a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit in my life every single day, and in particular through difficult times. Amen. I need to know He's there. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Because things will fail. Inventions will fail. Jobs will fail. Humans will fail. But we need to understand that we behold to the unchanging hand of God that He's God that cannot fail. And when we look at this, <coughs> this question, is that there's a man standing there. What do you got in your hand? What are you going? He goes, I'm going to measure. So here's a question for us. Do you measure up? And the, question, the answer to all these questions, these are rhetorical questions today. And you know what a rhetorical question is, right, moms and dads? It's when that your daughter or son is getting ready to go out of the house somewhere wearing something you didn't want them to wear. You would, say, you would ask them, are you wearing that? You're not asking. You can see right there what they have on. You're asking a rhetorical question, which means you're not wearing that out of the house. That's an example of a rhetorical question. The question that we're asking today is, do you measure up? And the answer is no. You know, if I was going to do an exercise with us today, we had, we had children in the sanctuary, I would have them get a piece of paper out and just kind of start doing the old-fashioned, the, the ruler idea. You know, that, that, that how we got that ruler idea was from the ruler of, of England and that what measured out and, and a furlong. You know, we have this 18-inch this journey here that uh, they call a cubit, you know, and all these things were set in order by a human. And when we measure up today, we were to say, I uh, have ourselves a contest. Whoever in this building has the most length in their family, you all are the best family in the house. Whoever's got the, you know, and so you got mom, you know, and then you got dad, and then you got the children, you just add up all those inches from head to toe, and now, all right, you all collectively are taller than anyone else in the house, and therefore, you measure up and no one else does. That's a ridiculous standard, isn't it? It's a silly standard for us, but when we look at the time in history, when we look at over things in time, in, in whatever era that we're living in, if you're living in the 20th century or you're living in the 21st century, there are things that we've used to look at people about whether or not they measure up and the standard that we would have. And, and, and when we look at, when we look at Romans, two, uh, Romans 1, 23, we understand that no one, there is none that does righteous, not even wrong. Romans Three uh, tells us that that uh, not one person is righteous. So, in other words, being from the right family is not good enough. Being from the right uh, neighborhood isn't good enough. Having the right education is not big enough. Or having a bigger house than anybody. Or having a smaller house. Some people wouldn't measure out themselves. Well, I know that God is. I know I measure up to God's righteous standard because I'm a poor person. That's the silliest saying. I know I measure up to God's right standard because I'm a rich person. Amen. And, and so we're looking at God's measurement. So if today that the measurement, do I measure up if I'm using my standards, then you know what I'm going to do if I'm using my standards, then I'm going to say things like this. If you're going to be a holy person of God, uh, you've got to wear a flashy suit on Sundays. If you're going to be a holy person of God, you've got to have a bald spot up here. If you're going to be a holy person of God, you've got to have a big nose. You've got to have some nose hair and some, and some ear hair. If you're going to be a holy, you follow what I'm saying. It's ridiculous. And that's what we're doing when we, when we use our own self-image to measure success or measure righteousness is that we're using the wrong kind of measurement. We're measuring against our own selves. People will say things like this. They'll say things like this. Well, I never killed anybody. Well, how do you know? I mean, how do you know for sure that your actions have never led to someone's death in any way, shape, or form? You see, we're, the, our measurement is too, is too small because God's standard is absolute 100% perfection. And that's why that he is prophesying here to tell this angel, I want you to run out here and I want you to measure this thing out because I'm not looking for a neighborhood. I'm looking for a place where I'm going to show myself. Do you see what in that text of scripture, he says that Jerusalem is going to be a city without walls. Now this is an unconscionable thought 
that, that they would build a city or rebuild a city and they would not put a wall up to keep all the people out that they didn't want in and to keep all the people in they didn't want out. And God says, I've got something better for you today. I've got You can't build a wall high enough to keep me out and you can't build a wall high enough to keep me in. I'm going to provide for you something better than that. I'm going to expand myself beyond the walls. Hallelujah. And we see Jesus who led us in this example. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, let us go to him. Where is he? Where we're following Jesus now. Let us go to him. Where? Outside the camp. Huh. He said, for in this world, I want you to hear this. In this world, we have no continuing city. So there is no, there is no place where you and I can find to live on this earth that's going to give us spiritual satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when I was going to Bible college back in North Carolina, there was a big television ministry not too far away from us. And so they tried to, they, people would work, the, they, they loved having Bible college students working there, so we had a job there. And, uh, uh, and, and things would, people would come there all the time, and they would say, oh, this is just like heaven on earth. You know, in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Now, if you say Chester, then that is like heaven and earth because that produced Faith Walden. That Faith of Falls who became Walden. Now, that is like heaven on earth. <laughs> people would visit there and they would say, this is just like heaven and earth. And I, and I heard people say, because I was working at a, at a night clerk in the, at, in the hotel desk there, and they would say, I believe if Jesus comes back, he's going to come back here. Well, they're, they're kind of sort of correct because when Jesus is coming back, all the earth is going to see him, all the earth, but they, that's not what they were indicating. We had an individual back in the early days of the church of God that believed that Jesus was coming back on a Harley Davidson. Amen. How about that? Brad? Amen. <laughs> coming back on a motorcycle. And, uh, and, and so they, they had a little section of, their, uh, of Cleveland, Tennessee that they said, this is where he's coming back, and they built a statue for him to, there's some uh, verse in Nahum or something like that about, you know, he, he rides uh, or something like that. And so that's what they thought. He's going back on a motorcycle, and that motorcycle is going to land right there. On the, now, how do we, people get so far afield? I'm using ridiculous ideas today to convey to you is that it's the same silliness for us to think that somehow by us in our own power, and uh, us in our own might, and us in our own strength, that somehow that's going to evoke the measurement of God to us. God says, I don't need a wall. Hallelujah. My fire is all around you. And Jerusalem is going to be so overwhelmed with people because I'm going to do a great work. And this is who we seek after. This is who we desire. What did David say? He said, you, O Lord. This is what David, the, the warrior, said. You, O Lord, are a shield about me, the glory and the lifter up of my head. This is David's perspective. David the king, David who had all, any of the women he wanted to have, David who had all the servants, David who had all of, the, all of these things, he said, you, O Lord, are a shield about me, the glory and the lifter up of my head. You know, playing hide and seek as a child, or, or, or tag, is that there would be a certain place that you would run to. And when you run to that, if it was this microphone stand, you say, I'm at home base, or I'm at, I'm at goal, whatever, ever how you played it in your neighborhood, we'd say, well, I'm at goal, or I'm at home base. And when you got there, then no one could get to you. And this is, this is the idea that we have. We think that there's some physical location or some some earthly indication that we're beyond the point of, of, of immutability or beyond the point, the place of us ever being uh, affected by anything in this world, but our foundation is in the Lord. And the Bible tells us that we, the Bible even says it's stronger language than what I'm saying today. It says that we're cursed when we make the arm of flesh our Savior. That's, I don't want to be cursed. I don't want to be cursed. Raise your hand and say hallelujah. You want to be cursed. Amen. No, no one wants to be cursed. We want to be blessed. And so when we, when we do that, then God wants to give us the indication is that we are with Him. We're safe in Him. Praise God. No one measures up on our own. Number, question, number two question is, do you have enough resources? In other, in other words, do you have enough money? This is a whole lot similar to the one uh, that I just said to you just a moment ago. 
But uh, in, in, in Zechariah chapter 2, beginning with verse 6, he says, Up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Up, Zion, escape you who dwell in the daughter of Babylon. I'm going to come back and explain why he's saying that in just a moment. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after, listen, listen. Thus says the Lord of hosts, verse, verse 8. He sent me after glory to the nations which you plundered. He who touches you touches the apple of his eye, for surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Do you have enough resources? In, in verse 6, here's what's he, God is having to ask this rhetorical question, and the answer is for them to get out of the land of the comfortable captivity. God says, next slide, to leave the land of the comfortable captivity. Because what, what God has had to say, now listen, we already established something, that they were living in a, in a foreign country. And uh, let's go to that map and then... Uh, here were, here's where they were at, is that uh, uh, I had the pleasure of visiting the Middle East back in 1990-91 for Desert Storm. Amen. And I went to Ur, and Ur is way out here. And Ur is just a mound of dirt. That's what God called Abraham, Abram out of. And so when they, when they came and they took them captivity, over here to my left is that fire over there is Jerusalem. And the first one that came and plundered them, carried them off to Assyria. And look how far up that is. That's, a, that's about uh, 900 miles. And then when, when, uh, when the Assyrian Empire fell uh, to, the, to the, the Persians, then the Persians did a swath. They just did a big sweep all the way from Assyria all the way down to end up in Susa. That's where Nehemiah was living. And so for 70 years, God said they were going to be captivity. That included the time that they were going to be in, uh, in, in, in Assyria for that short spell. And then the Babylonians uh, took them over and carried them, uh, carried them off. And then the Persians overwhelmed the Babylonians. And, and so all of that big swath of land that people are still fighting over today. Amen. That people are still fighting over today because there's lots of oil there. And, and there's 1,300 miles from Susa to Jerusalem. 1,300 miles. That's a long way to travel by car. How about, how about by foot? And so when we look at where they were at and where they were going to go, and for 70 years that they had been living there, is that many of them had become comfortable in the land of their captivity, and God sent a prophet to stir them up to tell them, I didn't call you to live in Babylon. I called you to live in the land that I gave you as a promise. And he's saying, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord. He's giving them a prophetic urgency for them to get out of the land that they were in, For them, even though the prophet had already said it, even though the 70 years had passed, is that many of them, and we discover in Nehemiah that it took 16 years for the rest of them to come out and make their mind up of getting that. And so here's what I'm saying to you, is that there are people today that they are comfortable living in the land of their captors. It's called the Stockholm Syndrome. Is that what happened to Patricia Hearst back? You remember Patty Hearst back in the 1970s? Is that she got she got kidnapped and she ended up, you know, conforming to the the, the ways of, of the of her captors. And then Elizabeth Smart was also very compassionate about the ones that kidnapped her. And so it was for God's people. Is that God had let them be carried away, not for them to live there, not for them to get happy there, not for them to get very comfortable there, but for them to remember that they were going to be carried away again and they would go back to the land that he had fulfilled his promise. And I have to tell you today is that the reality for most Americans is that we're not really excited about Jesus coming back. We're not really excited about the future because if we were, then we'd be, we would be more evangelistic. We would, you know, Noah built the ark for all those years and God fulfilled what he said he was going to do. And when God carried the people into, into captivity, he said, I'm going to fulfill what I said I'm going to do. And when Jesus taught the disciples, he said, every stone inside this building is going to be laid flat. And don't you know it? What Jesus said 
actually happened. So we have the reliability that God has given us two things. Number one, He's given us the promise of His coming. And number two, He's given us the forewarning of us not to get too comfortable on this world. That's what we used to say in the old Redneck Hymn book. We would say, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Amen. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And I'm not talking about having a nice place to live and a nice car to drive because I tell you what, driving a nice car is better than driving a jalopy. I'll just guarantee you that. But what, what it is is that it's not about owning things. It's about things owning us. Is that if we lost it all today, I, I, do we still have Jesus? If we lost it all, if we ended up going to jail for the cause of Christ, would we just forfeit our salvation? Would we, would we be willing? Because I tell you, and I've told you, and I'll continue to tell you, is that America, church of the living God that lives in America, we are foolish and arrogant to think that we're going to avoid persecution before, the, before everything wraps up. We're foolish and arrogant to think, well, you know, if we'll do this and we'll do that and we'll make sure this is in place and all these kinds of things, I'm telling you that there's not a constitution in the world strong enough to stop the purposes of God. Amen. 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 And so it's not, about, it's not about the world. God says, I'm going to deal with the world. God's challenge from Genesis to Revelation. God's challenge, if God has a challenge, is dealing with his own people. Amen. So that we would be mindful of the things that, that are temporary. So God is telling us to leave the land of comfortable captivity because at the end of the day, no matter how comfortable that you could be in a situation that, listen, you can live in a really, really super nice house, but if you're not the owner, then you're just living there. You can drive a super nice car, but if you're not the owner of that car, then you're just a chauffeur. Whatever we would put our stock in in this world is, is temporary at best. But here's what we need to grab a hold of understand is that what God has said in, in, in earlier in the chapter is that He would be our fire about us. God's glory is our comfort zone. Amen. That next slide says, God's glory is our comfort zone. The, 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 the thing that God has promised you and I, this is what He says here. This is not just apply. To Israel. It applies to spiritual Israel. And those are those that are Jews, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And he says, He who touches me them touches the apple of my eye. That's really the word pupil, but you know, when you look into that, you, you just see this beautiful, here the reflection of that is that the comfort zone that God has for you and I is that he says, I'm going to be your protector. I'm going to give you my favor. I'm going to give you my presence. And I'm going to give you my inheritance. What a promise that we have from God. Somebody say amen. amen. I mean, do, do we really think that God is going to somehow cheat us out of the best? <laughs> do we really think that somehow, I, 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 I get, uh, I, I get aggravated and laugh at the same time when I see different uh, fellows on television is that they're telling you all the wonderful things about Jesus and then they say, this is a great secret that nobody else knows about except you buy my DVDs and my book and then you'll find out these great secrets. Well, here's the wonderful secret. Here it is. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. What could be greater to know that God has given you the secure, eternal future from salvation in Him. What can be greater than that? Hallelujah. His glory is our comfort zone. Hallelujah. The glory of the Lord. It's what they had in the garden that they forfeited. It's what came down at the, at the day of Pentecost. That somehow we think we don't need in our lives sometimes. Next question. Do you have power over Satan? You have power over Satan. Zechariah chapter 3. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his, listen to this, Satan standing at his right hand. So Satan has is an interloper. Satan is an interloper. He's a thief. He comes but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Amen? This is the work of the enemy. Praise God. We ought to know a little bit about the devil. That's what we're talking about in our Bible studies on Wednesday night. The devil, disease, and deliverance. Is that, is, is, is that the question is, do you have power over Satan? And remember, these are all rhetorical questions. We say, well, wait a second, but Pastor, we do have power over Satan. But not in the way that we would think, because 
the reality is that right now is that the overwhelming majority, which means 51%, don't believe that there's actually a personage of the devil. They believe that it's just, you know, uh, evil working in evil force. So this is what the definition of the word devil is in the Bible. It, there's two words. The one word is diablos, where we get the word devil from. And then there's the word Satan, Satanus. And these are both uh, Greek words, but they're used in the Hebrew as well. One of them means the false accuser, the, or, or the evil one, and then and then Satan also that has a stronger uh, of, of the, the the strong definition of these is that the accuser of uh, of this word, the slanderer, and uh, and here in this in this apocalyptic vision is that Satan is standing at the right hand bringing the accusation. What's the problem with that? Number one is that that's not his place. You know, in the Bible it says, neither give place to the devil. You know, that, that word, the word place, neither, we'll talk about this this week in our Bible study, neither give place to the devil. It really, if you and I were to think about it in the sense of hospitality, is that we would say, we've got some guests coming over today, set an extra place at the table. It means that you have made a room for that person to come and sit at your table. It doesn't mean for us to destroy the devil because that's not our job, but it is our job to not give any place to the devil, not to set, not to be hospitable to the enemy, not to make room where the enemy can break. Now, I even heard somebody talking on the on twit face uh, about how that we should pray for Satan to get saved. There's no social media called Twitface. I made that one up. That we would think that what a ridiculous notion that somehow, and the Bible has said that he is condemned from the beginning, but he's got a, he's got a work to do. And, we, and, we, and he does so in an illegal fashion. This is a horrible illustration, but stay with me. Is that in the story of Robin Hood, we have Prince John uh, who has went away, and then we have the sheriff of Nottingham who has set himself up uh, as the one in charge and what Robin Hood does is go ahead and tries to displace everything that the sheriff does waiting for the prince to come back. The reason why that I say it's a poor illustration is because we don't serve an absentee God. He has given us the church, hallelujah, on the earth with the power of the Holy Spirit. But the earth does not belong to Satan. It never has and it never will be. Never, not and never, never one time has God ever turned the keys over to the enemy of our soul and say, you can have the earth. Now, he is working in an illegal fashion. He is working. He's already been deposed. He is waiting for his doom. And while he's doing that, he continues to do his horrible work. Jesus faced the devil. Hallelujah. And because he faced the devil, there's a picture of that we, we think uh, 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 the devil doesn't really look like this, but this is an artist rendition of the temptation that took place in the wilderness. And notice that Jesus is pointing in the picture here. He is pointing the finger at the devil. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And he, you know why, why he's doing that? It's because he's preaching. He's letting Satan know what the Word of God has to say. And you know what the Word of God has to say about these things. I don't want to go through these in particular today. But that when Jesus fought the devil, that Satan uh, uh, heard from him the Word of God. And it's in Matthew and Mark and it's in Luke. And they have this account. And, and when this is going on, then we understand that the Word of God has the first place in the situation. Thus say the Lord. Here's what the Lord says. Here's what the Word says. Praise God. That's why the question is, do we have power of the devil? And the answer is no, but the Word of God has power over the enemy of our soul. Hallelujah. 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 It is not for us to ignore that he exists. That doesn't make, you know, speak of the devil that he shall appear is a made up thing. It's not in the Bible. And I'm not going on a witch hunt. You don't have to go on a witch hunt. This illegal operation goes on all around us. It's called the world. The world. The system of the world. And when Jesus overcame the devil by the power of, of the Spirit, the Bible says in, in the book of Mark chapter 1, it says that when he was tempted, that he faced it, and he overcame it, and the angels came, and they ministered to him. 
And so here's, here's what I want to say to you, Flock, this morning, is that no matter what it is that you and I are facing, as, as, as our sister prayed for Pastor Proctor and Faith today, is that whatever you and I are facing, the God that we serve is more than enough. Amen? Amen. The God that we serve is more than enough. Glory to God. And in this vision of the high priest is that Joshua was actually the high priest over in Zechariah chapter 3. And then we see Satan standing there and he's accusing him. And he says, and the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Hallelujah. Glory to God forevermore. You and I don't have to read Brother Shiny Shoe's book. We don't have to buy the DVD series. All we have to do is find our refuge in the Lord our God. And He fights our battles for us. He will push back the hand of the devil. He will push back the lies of the enemy. And He said, This the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. The Lord rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire. Now, in this picture that we see, let's skip the next slide. Jesus is my superhero. Let's go to the next one. Is that is that we have the, the high priest clothing. Now, remember, Joshua had been the high priest in captivity. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. He had never had the opportunity. He had never had the opportunity to do this priestly work. They, they had just now got back. They hadn't rebuilt the temple. They hadn't constructed. They, didn't, they weren't aware because they were fully non-functional as the Jewish people. And so this wonderful outfit that he was given, the gold plate that says, Holy to the Lord, the turban on his head, the tunic, the breastplate, all of these various things that have deep meaning that uh, Leslie and I wish we could go into great detail for you today, is that th there's rich and deep meaning in this. But here's what I want you to understand today, is that you are and I are not the high priest anymore. Glory to God. There's no high priest that is among men anymore because that job has been taken by Jesus, our everlasting high priest. And when we look at Joshua in Zechariah chapter 3, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that this is an indication of what was coming very soon in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the next slide is that this is what he would hope to look for, but the next slide says, but this is what actually he was looking like. He was clothed in filthy garments, and when we look at the, at the stark contrast of that, when we look at the stark contrast of that, you know, there's a, a, a tradition in traditional black churches that they have a whiteout Sunday. And uh, I know that sounds kind of goofy if you're not familiar with that. Um, my, my friend Anthony Pelt, today his church in Florida is whiteout Sunday. Some of the white guys interacting with him said, what in the world is whiteout Sunday? Like, don't let the white people in your church this Sunday? No, good grief, no. It means that we're all going to be dressed in white that day so that we reflect today as the people of God, as a people holy and sanctified and set apart for the Lord. Now today, as we were supposed to be dressing up, there, there would be something that I, that I discovered when I was in the military, is that when people had their uniforms on, they got their boots polished, they've got all their spit and shine going on, is that they don't want anybody to mess up their uniform. <laughs> But that uniform is called a uniform for battle. It's not a uniform for looking good. If I was wearing all white today, I would be protected. I would, I would be worried about getting a stain on it. Something that would, I don't know about you, you ever wear a white shirt and eat spaghetti? I mean, it just, spaghetti sauce loves white shirts. It's just, shoop, it's just going there, you know. Right. When we look at the contrast of that wonderful high priest, we can bump back to that earlier screen for just a moment, uh, Caleb is that we look at the screen uh, uh, of the shot of this beautiful outfit that has all this rich and meaningful language enclosed in it. And here's what I'm saying, is that not one of you, when you got saved, ever said, oh, now that I'm saved, I'm looking forward to spiritual warfare. When I, now that I'm saved, I'm looking forward to the devil attacking me. Now that I'm saved, I'm really looking forward. Preachers don't say, every preacher, when we got called to preach, here's what we envision. We envision preaching, People getting saved, people coming to Christ, people joining the church, people raising the children, the church growing. That's what we envision. We envision people. You know, we didn't envision, oh, right, now I get to fight against every demon and devil in, the, 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 in every dark corner of, 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 of the area of which I am serving. But the reality of things, now we'll go back to the dark slide, the filthy slide, is that, that the enemy had brought something in and Satan was bringing his best against 
Joshua, who had not had yet an opportunity even to minister. Mm, help us this morning, Father. Hallelujah. He had not yet even had the opportunity to minister. But Satan was going to bring everything he had against him. And here's what I'm telling you today. Is that Satan is bringing everything he can and will against the child of God. Remember, your high priest. The Bible says that he is our great high priest. And unlike Satan who interlocked at the right hand of the altar, Jesus, hallelujah, is at the right hand of the Father. And he ever lived, makes intercession, ever lives to make intercession. Every single breathing moment of Jesus is now to pray and intercede for the church so that the filth can be removed from us. So that everything that we go against, everything the enemy, every target, every, every evil thought, every evil design come against. Don't be surprised, child of God. Don't be surprised. The Bible, Peter said, don't be surprised at the trial that you're going through. So don't be surprised, child of God. Matter of fact, we ought to rejoice. <laughs> we should rejoice that we're going through difficult times. Because, in other words, if the enemy could have destroyed you, Nick and I were talking about this for church, is that we've heard, you know, all his life and all my life that China is going to invade and take over the world because they got a third of the planet. And I just want to say, if China could have done it, they already would have. They got, they got a third of all the people. Just, you know, I remember hearing that as a child. But China's going to attack. And China, you know, 40, 50 years later, and, and who knows they might? I don't know. But here, here, we live in perpetual fear of what might happen. And, and that just does not apply to nuclear holocaust. It applies to walking out the doors this day and going back to your house. Is that people live in perpetual fear. And, and unfortunately, I'm talking about a lot of believers we live in perpetual fear of what the enemy might do. We live in perpetual fear of what the enemy might say. We live in perpetual fear of what the enemy, how things might not work out. But I tell you today, on the authority of God's word, is that Jesus has an angel. And Jesus has a message for us. And he comes to us and he says, get that filthy mess off of my servant. And put clean clothes on. Put a turban on his head. Because he's chosen. He's pulled like a branch. Pulled right out of the fire. And then when I'm through with him, he's going to be holy, set apart for the Lord. Hallelujah. Raise your hand to glorify the Lord this morning. Give him honor and give him glory and give him praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He gives him a promise. A wonderful promise. When, when the, what happens next? Is the Lord rebukes the devil. <laughs> he takes away the filthy garments. He cleanses us. Jesus, our wonderful example, when you got baptized in water, it was because you needed to, I needed to. Jesus had already, let me just say this, is that we got far too dry conversions. There should be something significant when we get baptized in water. When I got baptized, when I took a bath as a boy, I would get in and get out as quick as I could. And my mom and dad knew I hadn't cleaned all the way. I don't know how they knew that. They were geniuses. How do they know I hadn't? I was in, I was out, I was wet. But I wasn't clean. They knew it. They knew it by I mean, the amount of time in the tub. They knew it by the sweat rings still around my neck from playing outside all day long. They knew the stink was still on my body. And God does a wonderful work inside of you and I. And he gives us this promise, the promise that, listen, the promise that was attached to Joshua, the high priest there, the promise, listen, the promise that was attached to others is attached to you. The goodness of God that was attached to someone in the past is attached to you. You get to enjoy the benefits of their promise today. Hallelujah. And here's the promise. He said, here's what I'm going to do, Joshua. I'm going to remove the iniquity of the land in a day. Wow, what a prophecy. I'm going to remove the iniquity in a day. Now, again, again, even modern equipment can't do a cleanup in one day. So God, when he makes this ostentatious statement that I'm going to remove it all in one day, what's he talking about? He's talking about sin. 
He's talking about the effects of sin and how he does it. He moves it by cleansing us, by the washing of water, by the word. He cleanses us continually by the sanctifying word. That word sanctified means to set apart for a special purpose. That's what it means to be sanctified. Set apart for a special purpose. It's not, it's not, using, uh, uh, it's not using the screwdriver as a hammer. Amen. Is that using the, is that using the hammer uh, as a fork at the table? It's not using the gravy boat to drink Kool-Aid with. Everything's got a set-apart purpose. And you and I have a set-apart purpose. Amen. Say it. Say it out loud. I have a set-apart purpose. I have a set-apart purpose. Now, unfortunately, we have whittled down everything to fire insurance. We've whittled it all down to, well, you know, I'm saved. I'm not going to hell, praise the Lord. And that is a wonderful thing to rejoice about, that you're saved and you're not going to hell, praise the Lord. But God has, if you read the book, if you read the book, you know that God has a purpose and a calling attached to our lives. And so it is not, it is, let me just say it this way, it's really selfish of us to only think about what it means to be saved. At least I'm not going to hell. But now what? What's next? is that if God would employ you and I to lead others from the path of sin into righteousness, if God would employ you and I to fall in love with the one that we that loved us before we, we, while we were enemies with Him and hated ourselves, I will remove the iniquity of the land in a day. That's not just, listen, it's a past tense fulfillment having present tense possibilities. It's a past tense promise having present tense possibilities so that God wants to do a new work inside of you and I by doing that sanctifying work. Not just to stay away from what we shouldn't be doing, but to be set apart to do the things. In other words, don't misuse the gravy boat and the hammer, but use them for the purposes that they were intended. And this is what we prayed about last week when we sang at the altar call. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Father, that He would teach us. Holy Spirit, that He would show us. Jesus, that You would motivate us today to understand what it means to be really cleansed. I saw this all over town. You have to. Not all heroes wear capes. And that's talking about our health care workers and our first responders and how grateful we are to them. And I'll be just say, not all heroes Wear anything that indicates. We don't even think of ourselves today. I mean, we'd be really foolish to identify ourselves. I am a superhero. But the God inside of us is a mighty God. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. God inside of us. Christ in you. The hope of glory. So we don't have a right to deny it. Amen. Praise God. This is an unrelated illustration, but let me bring it closer to home. Is that I had read this and I had I was living by this. Is that there was somebody that was criticizing me constantly about, ooh, that's a nice Jacket you're wearing, you must make big money. Well, that's a nice car you got. You must be making big money all the time, just kind of goading me. And for the longest time, I would say, you know, I got this on sale. You know, I got a really good deal on this car. And then I was reading this book about being blessed, and I read about this guy who had the same experience with me, and the Lord said to him in the book, what are you doing? I blessed you with that. And like, yeah. That's right. So I'm like apologizing to this guy about the blessings of the Lord. And here's what I want to bring that home to you to, for us to say. Is that, is that when God has brought us out of a horrible pit. How many of you know that that illustration there in Zechariah. He was a high priest clothed in all the filth. And we can use the word filth in every possible application you can have. How many of you know that when God brings you out, you ought to tell somebody. Hallelujah. It's not self-righteousness to tell your story. Amen. 
It's not self-righteousness to say, I'm so glad that I'm not the big jerk I used to be. I'm so glad I'm not the womanizer I was. I'm so glad that blah, 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 that God has pulled you out of a horrible pit and established you going and put a song in your mouth. Somebody needs to hear your voice. Amen. Amen. To hear the goodness of God that would resonate. Yes. And that makes us superheroes not because of ourselves but because of Him. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Father, we love you today, God. We glorify your high and holy name. We bless you for your goodness today, your glory, God, your power, Lord. And God, today, Lord, I pray that, Lord Jesus, today in our children's lesson, God, the, the statement is, I can be saved. So, God, I'm praying for anyone today, Lord, that perhaps is someone that is covered in sin, obvious sin, and hidden sin, they're covered in it, God. Covered in the filth of this world and they think that God doesn't love them or they're not good enough. And all of the rhetorical statements and questions, God, that we ask today, God, are all real is that without you, we have nothing. But God, through you, we have everything. We have your great promise, your, your presence, your power, your glory, your inheritance, God, all that you have provided through Jesus, God, and that it goes back, Lord, 2,500 years, Lord, that promise, Lord, that we're talking about today, that is still alive and real, God. And I pray that anyone, Lord, that's under the sound of my voice that has not made Jesus Lord of their life, they would just say, I turn away from all that garbage and junk today, and I surrender my life to Christ in a fresh and living way. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, that's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. You make that statement and then you follow the Lord in your life and He will give you the encouragement and the strength to do those things. Hallelujah. If you're watching online today, as we get ready to finish up, I just want to make you aware uh, of, of a few things that are going on in our church. Number one is that if you want to worship God in giving today, you can do so online. Uh, if, uh, if we're on Switcher, there will be a screen at the, at the close 